Did you hear what I was playing, Lane? I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. No, I'm sorry for that, for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately. But I play with wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. Uh, speaking of the science of life, do you have the cucumber sandwiches cut up for Lady Bracknell? Yes, sir. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, oh, by the way, Lane, I saw that in your book, that on Thursday afternoon, when Lord Shorman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne were entered as having been drank. Yes, sir. Eight bottles. And a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably drink the champagne? I merely ask for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I have often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely of a first-rate brand. Good heavens! Is marriage as demoralizing as that? I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I have had very little experience of it myself up to the present. I have only been married once. That was in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. I don't know that I'm much interested in your family life, Lane. No, sir. It is not a very interesting subject. I rarely think of it myself. Very natural, I'm sure. That'll do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders of things don't set us a good example, what on earth is the use of them? They seem as a class to have very little moral responsibility. Mr. Ernest Worthing. Hello, my dear Ernest. What brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. What else should bring one anywhere? Eating as usual, I see, Algy. I believe that it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where on earth have you been since last Thursday? In the country. What on earth do you do there? Oh, when one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It is excessively boring. And who are the people that you amuse? Oh, <laughs> neighbors, neighbors. Got good neighbors in your part of uh, Shropshire? Yeah, perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. How immensely you must amuse them. Uh, by the way, your county is Shropshire, is it not? Uh, Shropshire, uh, yes, of course. Uh, hello. <laughs> Why are these cuffs? Why the cucumber sandwiches? Why such a reckless extravagance in one so young? Who is coming to tea? Oh, merely on to Gusta and um, Gwendolyn. Oh, perfectly delightful. <laughs> yes, yes, that is all very well. But I don't think on Gusta will quite approve of your being here. May I ask why? <laughs> My dear fellow, the way you f flirt with Gwendolyn is quite disgraceful. <coughs> it's almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I, I am in love with Gwendolyn, and I came to town expressively to propose to her. I thought you said you had come for pleasure. I call that business. How utterly unromantic you are. I don't see anything romantic in a proposal. It is very romantic to be in love. But there's nothing romantic about a definite proposal. One may be accepted. One usually is, I believe. And then the excitement is all over. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. If ever I get married, I'll certainly try hard to forget the fact. I have no doubt about that. The divorce court was made for people whose memories are so curiously constituted. <laughs> there is no use speculating on that subject, dear friend. Divorces are made in heaven. Uh, please, uh, please don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They're made specially for Aunt Augusta. Well, you have been eating them all the time. That is a very different matter. She is my aunt. Uh, have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. 
And very good bread and butter it is, too. Well, you need not eat it as if you were going to eat at all. You act as if you were already married to her. You're not already married to her. And I, find, and I see it very problematic, if you ever do. Why on earth would you say that? In the first place, women never marry the men that they flirt with. They don't think it right. <laughs> that is nonsense. It isn't. It accounts for the extreme number of bachelors that one sees about. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolyn is my cousin. And before I allow you to marry her, you'll have to clear up the whole thing of Cecily. Uh, uh, Cecily? What on earth do you mean? I don't know of anyone by the name of Cecily. Uh, what do you mean, Algy? By Cecily. Please retrieve me the cigarette case that Mr. Worthing left here in the smoking room last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Do you mean to say that you've had my cigarette case all this time? I wish it to goodness you had let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it, and I was very nearly offering a large reward. Well, I wish you would offer one. I happen to be more than usually hard up. No, there is no offering one now that the thing is found. That is very heartless of you, Ernest, I must say. Hmm. Oh, but now that I read the inscription inside, I find that the thing isn't yours after all. Oh, of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times, and you have no right whatsoever to read what's written inside. It is a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Oh, it is absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't read. More than half of modern culture depends on what one shouldn't read. I'm quite aware of the fact, but I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should talk of in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. This cigarette case was a present from someone of the name of Cecily. And you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well... If you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. <laughs> Your aunt? Yes. Charming old lady she is, too. Lives at Tunbridge Wells. Now, just give me back my cigarette. Yes, oh, you... but that does not account for why your aunt, who lives in Tunbridge Wells, calls herself Little Cecily. From Little Cecily with her fondest love. What on earth is there in that? There's some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. Surely that's a matter for an aunt to decide for herself. You seem to think that every single aunt should be exactly like your aunt, and that is absurd. For heaven's sake, just give me back my... Yes, yes. but... <laughs> but why does your small aunt Cecily, who lives in Tonnage Ringe Wells, call, call you her dear uncle? From little Cecily with her fondest love to her dear uncle Jack. I admit... There's no fault in an aunt being a small aunt. But why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, should call her own nephew her uncle? Yes, but why does your little aunt Cecily, who lives in Tunnelbridge Wells, call you her uncle? From little Cecily with her fondest love to her dear uncle Jack. I admit there is no problem with an aunt, no matter what her size with an aunt calling her, no, with an aunt being a small aunt, but why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, should call her own nephew her uncle? I can't quite make it out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It's Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. You have always told me that it was Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You're the most earnest-looking man I've ever met. It's perfectly absurd you're saying your name isn't Ernest. It's written on your cards. Uh, here's one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany. I'll keep this as proof whether you try to deny it to me, or to Gwendolyn, or to anyone else for that matter. But my name is Ernest in town. It's Jack in the country, and the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that does not account 
for why your small Aunt Cecily calls you her uncle. Come, old boy, you best have the thing out at once. Andrew, you talk exactly as if you were a dentist, all right? It is very vulgar to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It produces a false impression. Well, that is exactly what dentists always do. Now, I should mention that I have always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret Bunburyist, and I'm quite sure of it now. Bunburyist? <laughs> what on earth do you mean by a Bunburyist? I'll reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you tell me why you're Ernest in town and Jack in the country. Oh, very well. Then produce my cigarette case. Here it is. Now, produce your explanation, and pray, make it probable. My dear fellow, there's nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. The late Mr. Thomas, the late Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me in his will guardian to Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily? who addresses me as uncle by motives of respect, something you could not possibly appreciate, Algy, lives at my place in the country, under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. Uh, where is that place in the country, by the way? No, oh, that is nothing to you. <laughs> might I add that you're not going to be invited. And might I tell you quite candidly that the place is not in Shropshire? I suspected that, dear fellow. I've been buried all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now, why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? Oh, dear fellow, I don't know if you're going to be able to understand my real motives. You're hardly serious enough. So you see, when, when one is placed in the position of guardian, one must adopt a very high moral tone across all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone, one can hardly be said to conduce to either one's happiness or to one's health. I've always pretended to have a younger brother by the name of Ernest, who, who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. And that, my dear friend, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. How can you doubt it? Literary criticism is not your forte, dear fellow. Don't try it. You best leave that to the people who haven't studied in the university. They do it so well in the daily papers. What you really are is a Bunburyist. I suspected you of being a Bunburyist. You're one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth are you talking about? You have invented an invaluable friend, or brother in your case, by the name of Ernest, so that you may be able to come up to town as often as you like. I have invented an invaluable invalid named Bunbury, so that I may be able go to go down to the country as often as I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it weren't for Bunbury's extraordinarily bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you tonight at Willis's, for really I have been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. But I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You, abs you are absurdly careless about sending out invitations, Nothing annoys someone so much as not receiving an invitation. Well, you had much better dine with your Aunt Augusta, then. I have no intention on doing anything of the kind. To begin with, I dine there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. In the second place, whenever I do dine there, I'm always treated as a member of the family and set down with either two women or no women at all. In the third place, I know perfectly well whom she will place me next to tonight. She will place me next to Mary Farquhar, always flirts with her husband across the dinner table. It's not very decent. Indeed, it's not even decent, and that sort of thing is enormously on the increase. The amount of women who flirt with their own hus husbands in London is quite scandalous. It looks so bad, simply washing one's own clean linen in public. Besides... Now that I know you to be a confirmed Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunburying. I want to tell you the rules. I'm not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I would have killed him in any case. Cecily's a little too much interested in him. It's rather bore. So I'm going to get rid of Ernest. And I strongly advise you to do the same with your little Mr. 
Uh, with your invalid friend that has the absurd name. Nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury. And if you ever get married, which seems highly problematic, you would very much like to know Bunbury. A man, with, a man, who, know, a man who marries without knowing Bunbury. It's a very tedious time of things. That is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she's the only girl that I've ever loved, I certainly wouldn't want to know a Bunbury. Then your wife will. You don't seem to realize that in married life, three is company and two is none. And now that's the theory of the corrupt French drama which has been propounding for the last 50 years or so. Yes, and that the happy English home is proved in half the time. Algie, don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. It isn't easy to be anything nowadays. There's such ghastly competition about. <laughs> that must be on to Gasta. Only your relatives and creditors ever ring in that Wegarian manner. If, if I'm able to get on to Gasta out of the way for ten minutes so that you may have the chance of proposing to Gwendolyn, Will you allow me to dine with you tonight at Willis's? I, I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but do be serious about it. I hate people who aren't serious about their meals. It's so shallow of them. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Good afternoon, dear Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. I am feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. That's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. Uh, dear me, you are smart. I am always smart. Am I not, Mr. Worthing? Uh, you're quite perfect. I would highly hope that does not the answer, because I would leave absolutely no room for developments. And I have in many directions. <laughs> I'm sorry if we are a little late, Algernon, but I was obliged to call upon dear Lady Harbury. I haven't been there since her poor husband's death. I never saw a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. And I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Won't you come sit here, Gwendolyn? Thanks, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. Good heavens! Lane, where are the cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially for Aunt Augusta. There were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers? No, sir. Not even for ready money. Thank you, Lane. That will do. Thank you, sir. I am very greatly distressed to say, Aunt Augusta, that... There were no cucumbers, not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Algernon. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury, who seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. I heard that her hair has turned quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its color. From what cause I, of course, cannot say. Thank you, Algernon. I have quite the treat for you tonight. I'm going to put you down with Mary Farquhar. <laughs> she is such a nice woman, so attentive to her husband. It's delightful to watch them. I'm afraid, Aunt Augusta, that I'll have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight after all. I would hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your poor uncle would have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he is accustomed to that. Well, I have just received a telegram stating that my poor friend, Mr. Bunbury, is quite ill again. They think that I should be with him at his side. <laughs> it is strange. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. <laughs> Bunbury is a perfect invalid. Well, I must say, Algernon, I think it is high time Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live or die. This shilly-shallying with the question is absurd, nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Health is the primary duty of life. Illness of any kind should not be encouraged in others. I'm always telling that to your poor uncle, but he never seems to take much notice, as far as any concern in his ailment goes. Well, I would be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury from me to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that should encourage conversation, especially at the end of the season when everyone has said practically everything they had to say. Well, I will speak to Bunbury on Tagasta if he's still conscious, but 
I can guarantee that he won't have a relapse on Saturday. And now, the music is a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't talk. If one pay, plays bad music, people don't listen. But I will run over the program. If you'll kindly follow me into the next room for a moment. Oh. Thank you, Algernon. It's very thoughtful of you. I'm sure the program will be delightful after a few expurgations. French music I cannot possibly allow. It is always improper. People always seem to think it is vulgar or they laugh. Either is worse. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Certainly, Mama. A charming day it has been, Miss Fairfax. Pray, don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always fear they mean something else. Oh, uh, I... That makes me so nervous. I, I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. And I would like to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's uh, temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back into a room suddenly that I have quite often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax, ever, ever since I met you, I've admired you more than any girl I've ever met since, since I met you. Yes, I am quite well aware of the fact, and I often wish that in public, at any rate, would have been more demonstrative. For me, you have always been an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I knew I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines and has reached the provincial pulpits, as I'm told. And my ideal has always been to love someone by the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first told me he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn. Passionately. Gwendolyn, you don't know how happy you've made me. Oh, my own Ernest. But, but do you mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest? But your name is Ernest. Yes, but supposing it was something else. Do you mean to say that you couldn't love me then? Ah, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation. And like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference, if any at all indeed, to, facts, to the facts of your life as we know them. Uh, really, darling, to, to speak quite candidly, I don't care for the name of Ernest. I, I don't think it suits me. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibrations. Well, well really, Gwendolyn, I, I think there are a lot of much nicer names out there. I, I, I think Jack, for instance. Charming name. Jack. No. There is very little music in the name Jack, if any at all indeed. It does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John, and I pity any woman married to a man named John for she would never know the entrancing moment's pleasure of a single moment's solitude. The only really safe name is Ernest. Uh, Gwendolyn, I, I, I must get christened at once. I, I, I mean, we must get married at once. There, there is no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Worthing? Well, surely. You have led me to believe that you are not undoubtedly different to me, and you know that I love you. I adore you, Mr. Worthing, but nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched on. Well, um, uh, may, may, may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity, and to spare you any disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I find it that I have to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept you. Gwendolyn! Yes, Mr. Worthing, what have you got to say to me? 
Oh, you, you know what I've got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it. Gwendolyn, will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. How long have you been about it? I'm afraid you have very little experience in how to propose. My own darling, you're the only woman that I've ever loved. Yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does. All my girlfriends tell me so. What beautiful blue eyes you have, Ernest. They are quite, quite blue. I hope you always look at me just like this, especially when other people are around. Mr. Worthing, right, sir, from the center of recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. Uh, Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? Mr. Worthing and I are engaged to be married. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged, I or your father, should his health permit him, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come on a young woman as a surprise. Pleasant or unpleasant, as the case may be. It's hardly a matter that she could be allowed to arrange for herself. Now I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. While I'm making these inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. But, Mama... In the carriage, Gwendolyn. <laughs> Gwendolyn, the carriage! Yes, Mama. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Uh, uh, thank you, Lady Bragna. I, I prefer standing. I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men. Although I have the same list as dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I'm quite ready to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Uh, well, uh, yes, I'm, I must admit, I, I do smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? You're 29. Very good age to be married at. I've always been of opinion that a man should either know everything or nothing. Which do you know? I, I, I know nothing. I'm pleased to hear it. I've always been of desire that no one should tamper with natural ignorance. It's like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. What is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or in investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What well, between the one given to one during one's lifetime and the ones extracted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one duties and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that needs to be said about land. I have a country house with some land attached to it, about 1,500 acres. But I don't depend on that for my real income. <laughs> as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people that make anything out of it. A country house? How many bedrooms? That point can be cleared up after. You have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. I own a house in Elgrave Square. But it is led by the year to Lady Bloxham. But I can get it back whenever I'd like at a six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, uh, she goes about very little. A lady considerably advanced in years. <laughs> Nowadays, that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? 149. The unfashionable side. I thought there was something. However, that could be easily altered. The, the, the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? I'm, I'm afraid I don't have any. I, I'm, a, I'm a liberal unionist. They count as Tories. They dine with us, or come in the evening at any rate. Now into minor matters. Are your parents living? Um, I'm, I'm afraid I've lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as an unfortune. <laughs> to lose both looks like carelessness. Who's your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. 
Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce, or did he rise from the ranks of aristocracy? I'm, I'm afraid I really don't know, Lady, Lady Bracknell. But the, the fact of the matter is that I've lost both my parents. Or it would be nearer the truth to say that my parents have lost me. I, I was found. Found? Yes, in, in a railway station. Uh, Mr. The late Mr. Thomas Cardew found me and gave me the name of Worthing because I happened to have a first-class ticket of Worthing at the time, or he happened to have a first-class ticket of Worthing at the time. Worthing's a place in Sussex, uh, a, a seaside resort. And where did this charitable man with the first-class ticket to this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell, a rather ordinary brown hand leather handbag with handles on it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. And where did this kind Thomas James Cardew find this ordinary handbag? In the Victorian station. The, the Victoria Station. The, the, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial. Mr. Worthing, I feel, I must confess, I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate, bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds me of one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As to the particular locality in which this handbag was found, the railway station, Victoria Station, might serve to conceal a social indiscretion, has probably indeed been used for that purpose, but it could hardly be an assured basis for a recognized position in good society. But may I ask what exactly you would advise me to do, Lady Bracknell? I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. <laughs> I would advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible, and to make a definite effort to produce at least one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. I don't know how I could possibly manage to do anything of the kind. I could produce the handbag at any moment. It is in my cloakroom at home. But surely that should be enough to, to satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What has this to do with me? You could hardly expect that Lord Bracknell and I would dream of allowing our only daughter, daughter brought up with utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Good morning. Algy, stop playing that ghastly tune! How idiotic you are! Didn't it go off all right, old boy? You don't mean to tell me that Gwendolyn refused you. I know it is a way that she has with people. She's always refusing them. I find it most ill-natured of her. Gwendolyn is as right as a trivet. As far as she is concerned, we are engaged. Her mother, on the other hand, is a perfectly unbearable. Never met such a gorgon. I don't really know what a gorgon is like, but I'm quite sure Lady Bracknell is one. In any case, she's a monster without being a myth, which is rather unfair. I beg your pardon, Algie. I suppose I shouldn't talk of your aunt in that way before you. My dear boy, I love hearing my relations abused. It's the only thing that makes me put up with them at all. Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't got the remotest knowledge on how to live with the smallest instinct on when to die. That is nonsense. It isn't. But... And I won't argue about the matter. You always want to argue about things. Well, that is exactly what things were originally made for. What on earth is there in that? It isn't. If I thought that, I'd shoot myself. Um, uh, uh, do you think Gwendolyn will become like her mother in about 150 years or so? All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man ever does. That is his. Is that clever? It's perfectly phrased. And quite right, as anything in civilized life should be. I'm sick to death of cleverness. Everyone's clever nowadays. You can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. 
thing has become an absolute public nuisance. I wish we had a few fools left. We have. Well, I should extremely like to meet them. But what do they talk about? The fools? They have the clever people, of course. <laughs> what fools? Uh, by the way, did you tell Gwendolyn about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, the truth isn't the sort of thing you say to a nice, young, pretty, innocent girl like Gwendolyn. Look what extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. The only way to behave to a woman is to love her if she is pretty and someone else if she is plain. That is nonsense. What about your brother Ernest? What about the profligate Ernest? Oh, uh, right, I shall have gotten rid of him by the end of the week. I'll say he died in Paris of apoplexy. There lots of people die of apoplexy. And quite suddenly, don't they? Yes, but it's hereditary, my friend. You have much better to say that he died of um, a severe chill. Uh, you don't suppose a severe chill is hereditary, do you? Of course it isn't. Oh, very well. My brother Ernest to be carried off in Paris by a severe chill. Now that gets rid of him. It, but I thought you said that... Miss Cardew was a little bit too interested in your dear brother Ernest. Uh, won't she feel his loss a great deal? De Cecily's not a sweet romantic girl, and I'm glad to say. She has a capital appetite and goes on long walks and pays no attention to all her lessons. I would rather much like to meet Cecily. Oh, I pray very much well that you never do. She's excessively pretty and only just 18. Have you told Gwendolyn that you have an excessively pretty ward who's only just 18? One does not blurt such things out to people. Gwendolyn and Cecily are bound to be extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything you'd like after a half an hour after they've met, they'll be calling each other sister. <laughs> Women only do that after they've called each other a lot of other things first. Uh, now, we really must go and change if we want to get a good table at Willis's. Did you know that it is almost nearly seven? Oh, it is always nearly seven. Well, I'm hungry. I never knew a time when you weren't. What shall we do after dinner? Uh, go to the club? Oh, no, I hate talking. Well, then we could go to the theatre. Oh, no, I hate listening. Well, I suppose we could trot around the Empire at ten. Oh, no, I loathe looking at things. It is so silly. Well, what on earth shall we do? Nothing! It is very difficult doing nothing. But I don't mind difficulties when there's no object of any kind. Miss Fairfax. Gwendolyn, upon my word. Al, do you kindly turn your back? I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthing. Gwendolyn, I don't think that I can allow this at all. Algy, you always adopt a strictly immoral attitude towards life. I don't think you are quite old enough to do that yet. darling. Ernest, we may never be married. From the look of my mother's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regards to what their children say to them. The old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I had over my mother, I lost at the age of three. Although she may prevent us from being married, and I may marry someone else, and marry often. Nothing will ever alter my eternal devotion to you. G Gwendolyn. The story of your romantic origin, as related to me by my mother, with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibers of my nature. Your Christian name is an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character is exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Your town address in the Albany I have. What is your address in the country? The manor house, Woolton. Hertfordshire. 
There's a good postal service, I suppose. There may ne be a need to do something desperate, but that, of course, will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. Very well. I'm, I'm here in town till Monday. Good, good, good. Algy, you may turn around now. Thanks. I've turned around already. And you may ring the bell. <laughs> and may I see you to your carriage, Miss Fairfax? Certainly. Well, I will see Miss Fairfax out. Yes, sir. No, thank you. I, no, really, I'm, I'm okay. No, fine. Sherry Lane. Yes, sir. But tomorrow I will be going Bunburying Lane. Yes, sir. You can put out my dress clothes, my smoking jacket, and all the other Bunbury suits. Yes, sir. I hope, Lane, that tomorrow is a good day. It never is, sir. What a perfect pessimist you are, Lane. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. Thank you, Lane. That will do. Now, there is a sensible, intellectual girl. The only girl I've ever cared about my entire life. What are you so amused about? Oh, I'm merely anxious about Bunbury, that is all. If you don't take care of your friend Bunbury, your friend Bunbury will get into a serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They're the only things that are never serious. But that is nonsense. You're always talking nonsense. Well, I always do. Cecily? Cecily! Surely such a utilitarian occupation as the watering of flowers is rather more tin's duty than yours, especially at a time when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar's on the table. Pray open it at page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. But I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he's leaving for town. Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he is so serious. I think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanor is to be especially commended in one so comparatively young as he is. Well, I know no one who has a higher sense of... I suppose that is why he often looks a little bored when we three are together. Cecily, I'm surprised at you. Your Mr. Worthing has no room for trivial, idle merriment or triviality in his life, especially with all of his troubles. You know how anxious he is about that unfortunate young man. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometime. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I'm sure you certainly would. You know, German and geology and things of that kind influence a man very much. I do not think that even I could have an effect on someone who, by his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and vacillated. I do not think I would even desire to reclaim him. Not in favor of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. Oh, you must put away your diary, Cecily. Really, I don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is a diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles all the things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. 
I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that Moody sends us. Don't do not speak slightingly of the three-volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself in earlier days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. Was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. Well, I spoke in the sense of being lost or mislaid. To your work, child, these speculations are profitless. But I see dear Dr. Chasuble coming up through the garden. Dr. Chasuble, well, this is indeed a pleasure. How are you this morning? Miss Prism, you are, I trust, well. Miss Prism has just been complaining to me about a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good to have a short stroll with you in the park, Dr. Chasuble. Cecily, I have not said anything about a headache. No, dear Miss Prism, I know that. But I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that, and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily, you are not inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. That is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from bees. <clears throat> Mr. Worthing, I suppose, has not returned from town yet. We do not expect him until Monday afternoon. Ah, uh, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sundays in London. He's not one of those whose sole aim is enjoyment, as by all accounts that unfortunate young man his brother seems to be. But I must not disturb Egeria and her pupil any longer. Egeria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. A classical illusion, merely. Drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at Evensong. I think perhaps I will have that stroll with you. I find I have a headache after all, and a walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Prism, with pleasure. We might go as far as the schools and back. Well, that would be delightful. Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. Horrid political economy. Horrid geography. Horrid, horrid German. Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany W. Uncle Jack's brother. Did you tell him Uncle Jack was still in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He said he was anxious to speak to you privately for a moment. Ask Mr. Ernest Worthing to come here. I suppose you had better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Yes, miss. I have never met any really wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I'm so afraid he will look just like everyone else. He does. Oh, you must be my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. You are under some strange mistake. I'm not little. In fact, I believe I am more than usually tall for my age. Oh, but I am your cousin Cecily. You, I see from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother. My cousin Ernest. My wicked cousin Ernest. Oh, you mustn't think that I'm wicked, cousin Cecily. I'm not wicked. If you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you've not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Well, now that you mention it, I have been rather reckless. I'm glad to hear it. In fact, I have been quite bad in my own small way. I don't think you should be so proud of that, though I'm sure it must have been very pleasant. It is much pleasanter being here with you. I can't understand how you were here at all. Uncle Jack won't be back till Monday afternoon. That is a great disappointment to me, for you see, I have been engaged to a business meeting that I am very eager to miss. Couldn't you miss it anywhere but in London? <laughs> no, the appointment is in London. Well, I know how important it is for anyone not to keep a business engagement if anyone wants to retain any sense of the beauty of life. But still, I think you should wait until Uncle Jack returns. I know he wants to speak to you about your emigrating. About my what? Your emigrating? He's gone up to buy your outfit. 
I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. He's no taste in neckties at all. <laughs> I don't think you'll be needing neckties. Uncle Jack, it's sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. <laughs> well, the accounts that I've had of the next world on Australia are not particularly encouraging. Uh, this world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I'm not that. It, that is why I hoped that you would reform me this afternoon. You might make that your mission. I'm afraid I've no time this afternoon. Well, uh, would you mind my reforming myself, then? It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. I will. I feel better already. You are looking a little worse. Uh, that is because I'm hungry. How forgetful of me. I should have remembered that when one is going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Uh, thank you, but uh, might I have a buttonhole first? Never have any appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. A Marshall meal? I'd sooner have a pink rose. Why? Because you are like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. I don't think you should speak to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You're the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says all good looks are a snare. They are a snare that any sensible man would like to be caught in. I don't think I should care to catch a sensible man. I wouldn't know what to talk to him about. You're much too alone, dear Dr. Trottle. You should get married. A misanthrope, I can understand. A womanthrope, never. Believe me, I do not deserve any logistic phrase. The precept, as well as the practice of the primitive church, was distinctly against matrimony. That is obviously the reason why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. You do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Men should be more careful. This very celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. But is a man not equally as attractive when married? No married man is ever attractive except to his wife. And often I've been told not even to her. Well, that depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can always be depended on. Ripeness can be trusted. Young women are green. I spoke culturally. Uh, my metaphor was drawn from Bruce, but where is Cecil? Perhaps she followed us to the schools? Mr. Worthing. Mr. Worthing? It seems that I have... Arrived sooner than I expected. Dr. Chasuble, I hope all is well. Mr. Worthing, I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. No shameful debts and extravagance? Still leading his life of pleasure. Uh, uh, dead. Your brother Ernest. Dead. Uh, quite dead. What a lesson for him I trust you will profit by it. Mr. Worthing, I offer you my sincere condolences. You at least have the consolation of knowing you are always the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernest. It is a sad, sad blow. He had many faults. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? No. He died abroad. In, in Paris, in fact. I received word from the manager of the Grand Hotel. And was the cause of death mentioned? It seems he was carried off by severe chill. As a man so, so shall he reap. Charity, dear Miss Prism, charity. None of us are here perfect. I myself am peculiarly susceptible to drafts. Would the internment take place here? Uh, uh, um, no, he seems to have expressed a desire to be buried in Paris. In Paris? I fear that hardly points to any very serious state of mind at the last. You no doubt wish me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. My sermon on the meaning of man in the wilderness can be adapted to almost any occasion, joyful or, as in the present case, distressing. I preach it at harvest celebrations, christenings, confirmations, and day morning and festival days. The last time I delivered it was as a charity sermon on behalf of the Society for the Prevention of Discontent Among the Upper Orders. 
the bishop who was present was much struck by some of the analogies I drew. You, you mentioned christenings, I believe, yes? It, I suppose you know how to christen. I mean, you are continually christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in this parish. I have often spoken to the poor, sub poor classes on the subject, but they do not seem to know what thrift is. But is there any particular infant in whom you are interested, Mr. Wedding? Oh. Your brother was, I believe, unmarried, was he not? Uh, oh, yes. Most yes. people who live entirely for pleasure usually are. It is not for any child, dear doctor. No, no I'm very fond of children. But, but the fact of the matter is that I'd like to be christened myself this afternoon, if you have nothing else better to do. But surely, Mr. Wedding, you have been christened already. Uh, I... I don't remember anything of the sort. But have you any grave doubts on the subject? Uh, I certainly intend to. If you have nothing else better to do, or you suppose I'm a little too old now. Not at all. The sprinkling and, indeed, immersion of adults is a perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? You need have no apprehension. Sprinkling is all that is necessary, or indeed all I think advisable. Our weather is so changeable. At what hour do you wish the ceremony to take place? Yeah, yeah, might I trot around at about five, if that would suit you? Perfectly, perfectly. In fact, I have two similar ceremonies to perform at that time. A case of twins born on one of the outlying cottages on your own estate. Poor Mr. Jenkins, the carter. A most hard-working man. Oh, I don't see much fun in being christened along with other babies. It is rather childish. Uh, it would half past five work for you. Admirably, admirably. And now I will not intrude any longer into a house of sorrow. I would merely ask of you not to be too bowed down by grief. What seem to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. This seems to me a blessing of an extremely obvious kind. Uncle Jack? Oh, I'm pleased to see you back. But what horrid clothes you've got on. Do go and change them, Cecily. My child. My child. What is the matter, Uncle Jack? Do look happy. You look as if you'd had a toothache. And I have got such a wonderful surprise for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother. Who? Your brother, Ernest. He I arrived about a half an hour ago. I, I haven't got a brother. That, that is absurd. Don't say that. However badly he may have behaved to you in the past, he is still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll tell him to come here. You will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? These are very joyful tidings. It seems to me his sudden return is... Somewhat distressing. I don't know what all this means. My brother's in the dining room. I think it's all perfectly absurd. But, oh, good heavens. Dear brother John, I have come down to ta town from town to tell you expressively that I am extremely sorry for all the trouble that I've caused you. I intend to lead a better life in the future. You are not going to refuse your own brother's hand, are you, Uncle Jack? Nothing induces me to take his hand. I think his coming down here is rather disgraceful. And he knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everyone. Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, whom he goes to visit so often. And surely there must be much good in one who leaves the pleasures of London and sits by a bed of pain. Has he been talking to you about Bunbury, hasn't he? Yes, he has. <sighs> and he has told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Bunbury. Well, there'll be no more talking about Bunbury or anything else. It's enough to drive one perfectly frantic. I admit that all the faults were on my side, but I must say that I find Brother John's coldness to me particularly painful especially since it is the first time of me ever coming down here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. This is the last time I shall ever do it. It is pleasant, is it not? To see so perfect a reconciliation, I think we might leave the two brothers together. Cecily, you will come with us. Certainly, Miss Prism. My little task of reconciliation is over. You've done a beautiful thing today, dear child. Now we must not be premature in our judgments. I feel very happy.
This ghastly state of things is what you call bun burying, I suppose. I have put Mr. Ernest's things in the room next to your own. I suppose that is all right. What? Mr. Ernest's luggage. I have unpacked it and put it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. Merriman, order the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. What a fearful liar you are, Jack. I haven't been called back up to town at all. Yes, you have. I haven't heard anyone call me. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures in the slightest degree. I can quite understand that. Well, Cecily is a darling. Don't talk about Miss Cardew like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly ridiculous in them. It is very childish to be in deep mourning for someone who is really staying with you in your own house as a guest for an entire week. I call it grotesque. Uh, you are not certainly staying for more than a week or anything of the kind. D Algy, you have got to go as soon as possible and, and buy the 4-5 train. Well, I certainly won't leave you as long as you're in mourning. I'd find it very heartless if I did. If I was in mourning, you would stay with me, I suppose. If you didn't, I'd find it most unkind. Well, will you leave if I change my clothes? Yes, but do be quick about it. I've never seen anyone take so long to change with such little result. Well, at least I'm not as overly dressed as you always are. If I am occasionally overdressed, I always make up for it by being immensely overeducated. Your vanity is ridiculous, and your conduct is an outrage, and your presence in my garden is utterly absurd. You have got to go, and, and buy the 4-5 train, and I hope you have a pleasant journey back to your hometown. Bunburying, as you call it, hasn't been a real success for you, has it? Well, I think it's been a great success. I'm in love with Cecily, and that is everything. But I must see her before I go and make arrangements for another Bunbury. Ah, there she is. Oh, I merely came to water the roses. I, I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He went to order the go dog cart for me. Oh, is he going to take you for a nice nap? He's going to send me away. Then have we got to part? I'm afraid so. It's very painful parting. It is always painful to part from those whom one has known for such a brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity, but even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. Thank you. The dog cart is waiting at the door, sir. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes? Yes, miss. It, Cecily, I hope I don't offend you if I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be the absolute personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to read it, may I? Oh, no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own... ...and consequently meant for publication. When it appears in volume form, I will order a copy. But pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You can... I'm quite ready for more. <coughs> oh, don't cough, Ernest. When one is speaking... One should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell a cough. Cecily, ever since I looked upon your beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly... I don't think that you should tell me that you love me 
wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? <laughs> Cecily! The dog cart is waiting, sir. Oh, tell it to come round next week at the same hour. Yes, sir. I think Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed to find out that you are staying on till next week at the same hour. I don't care about Jack. I don't care about anyone in this whole world. Besides you. You will marry me, won't you, Cecily? You silly boy. Of course. Why, we have been engaged for the last three months. For the last three months? Yes. It will be exactly three months on Thursday. But uh, uh, how did we become engaged? Well, ever since the uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you, of course, became the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And, of course, a man who is very much talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in it, after all. I dare say it was foolish of me, but I fell in love with you, Ernest. And when was our engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I was determined to end the matter one way or the other. And after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under this dear old tree here. The next day I bought this ring in your name, and this bangle with the true lover's knot I promised you always to wear. But did I get you this? It's very pretty, isn't it? Yes. You wonderfully good taste. It's the excuse I've always given you for leading such a bad life. And this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. Uh, my letters? Uh, I haven't written you any letters. You need not remind me of that, Ernest. I remember all too well. I was supposed to write your letters for you. I wrote three times a week and sometimes often. Well, do let me read them, oh, Cecily. I couldn't possibly. They would make you far too conceited. The three you wrote me after I broke off the engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled that even now I can hardly read them without crying a little. Uh, was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was. On the 22nd of last March. You can see the entry if you would like. Today, I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. But... Why did you break it off? What had I done? I had done nothing. It hurts me very greatly to hear that you broke off our engagement, especially when the weather was so charming. It hardly would have been a really serious engagement if it hadn't broken off at least once. But I forgave you before the week was out. Oh, what a perfect angel you are, Cecily. You dear romantic boy. I hope your hair curls naturally, does it? With a little help from others. I'm so glad. You won't ever break off our engagement again, will you, Cecily? I don't think I can, now that I've actually met you. Besides, there is the question of your name. Uh, <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> you must not laugh at me, darling. But it has always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone by the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband's name isn't Ernest. <laughs> yes, but you don't mean to tell me that if my name were anything else, you wouldn't be able to love me. But what name? Oh, any name you like. Elgie, for instance. I don't like the name Elgie. Uh, well, my dear, sweet, loving little darling, I don't see why you shouldn't like the name of Elgie. Uh, half the chaps that get into the bankruptcy court are named Algernon. Uh, it's a very aristocratic name. Uh, but uh, seriously, if my name were Algy, would you be able to love me? I might respect you, Ernest, and I might admire your character, but I feel I would not be able to give you my undivided attention. <coughs> uh, Cecily, uh, your rector, I... Suppose that he is well-practiced and up-to-date with all the ceremonials and practices of the church. Oh, Dr. Chasuble is a most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. Okay, well, I must see him on a most important christening. I, 
mean on the most important business. Oh. Uh, I shan't be away for half an hour. Considering that we have been engaged since the 14th of February, and today is the first time I have met you in person, I think it rather hard that you leave me for so long a period as half an hour. Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back as soon as I can. What an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much. I, I should enter his proposal into my diary. Oh, Miss Fairfax has just called to see Mr. Worthing. On very important business, Miss Fairfax states. Isn't Mr. Worthing in his library? Mr. Worthing went in the direction of the rectory some time ago. Pray, ask the lady to come out here. Mr. Worthing should be back soon, and you can bring tea. Yes, miss. Miss Fairfax, I suppose many of the good elderly women who are associated with Uncle Jack and his philanthropic work. I don't quite like women who are interested in philanthropic work. It seems what of them. Miss Fairfax. Pray, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew. What a very sweet name. I can tell we're going to be great friends. I like you already much more than I can say. Oh, nice of you to like me so much after knowing each other for such a comparatively short time. Pray, sit. I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure. And you always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. Then it is all quite settled, is it not? I hope so. I suppose this would be an admirable time for me mentioning who I am. I am the daughter of Lord Bracknell. You've never heard of Popo, I suppose? I don't think so. Hmm. Outside the family circle of Popo, I'm glad to say, is entirely unknown. I think that is quite as it should be. The home is the perfect social sphere for the man. Once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes so effeminate, does he not? Mama, C Cecily, Mama's views on education have brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. So would you mind at me if I looked at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all. I'm very fond of being looked at. You are here on a short visit, I suppose? Oh, no. I live here. Really? No doubt your fe mother or some other female relative of the sort resides here? Oh, no. I have no mother nor any relations, in fact. Indeed? Yes. My guardian, with the arduous task of Miss Prism, has the help of raising me. Your guardian? Yes, I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Hmm. Mr. Worthing never mentioned to me that he had a ward. How very secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. But, however, I am bound to state that this fills me with feelings of unmixed delight. Cecily, I am very fond of you. I have liked you ever since I met you. But I am bound to state that, since I know you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I wish you were... A little older than you seem to me, and not so very alluring in your presence. And if I may speak quite candidly, Cecily. Yes, pray. I believe that when anyone has anything unpleasant to say, one should always speak quite candidly. Well, I speak with perfect candor, Cecily, when I say I wish you were full 42 and not so very alluring in your presence. Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honor. Disloyalty would be almost as impossible to him as deception. But even the men of the strongest noble character can be susceptible to the charms of others. Modern, no less than ancient history, has led us with many painful examples of this. If it were not so, history would be quite unreadable, would it not? I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn, but did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me that he had a brother. I'm sorry to say, they have not been on good terms for a long time. Ah, that accounts for it. Now that I think of it, I have never once heard a man mention his brother. The subject seems most distasteful to them. 
Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. It would be awful if something like this came across a friendship like ours. But you are quite sure it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian? Quite sure. In fact, I'm going to be his. I beg your pardon? Dear Gwendolyn, there is no reason I should make a secret of it to you. Our little county newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week that Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. I feel like there must be some slight error, Miss Cardew, for Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me, and it shall appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the latest. I fear there might be some slight misconception, but Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. I feel there's some slight error, Miss Cardew, for Mr. Ernest Worthing proposed to me yesterday at 5.30 in the afternoon. And if you would care to verify the incident, pray do so. I always bring my diary along with me. It gives me something sensational to read on the train. I am so very sorry, dear Cecily, if it causes you any distress, but I am afraid I have the prior claim. It would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolyn, if it caused you any mental or physical anguish, but I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he clearly has changed his mind. If my poor fellow has been trapped into any foolish promise, I swear I will rescue him with a firm hand. Whatever foolish engagement my boy may have got himself into, I will never reproach it with him until after we are married. Do you elude me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On a moment of this kind, it becomes more than one's duty to speak the mind. It becomes a pleasure. Do you, just Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? This is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I am glad to say I've never seen a spade. It's obvious that social spheres have been wildly different. Shall I lay tea here as usual, Miss? Yes. As usual. Are there many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew? Oh, yes, a great many. From one of the hills nearby, one can see five counties. Five counties? I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. I suppose that is why you live in town. What a nice, well-kept garden you have here, Miss Cardew. So glad you like it, Miss Fairfax. I had no idea there were this many flowers in the country. Oh, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. Personally, I do not understand how anybody who is anybody can live in the country if anybody who is anybody does. The country always bores me to death. Ah, this is what the newspapers call agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering from it just at present. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, I've been told. Would you like some tea, Miss Fairfax? Yes, please. Detestable girl, but I require tea. Sugar? No, sugar is not fashionable anymore. Cake or bread and butter? Bread and butter. Cake is rarely seen in the best houses nowadays. Hand that to Miss Fairfax. You have filled my tea with lumps of sugar, and even though I specifically asked for bread and butter, you gave me cake. I am known for the gentleness of my nature and the kindness of my disposition, but I warn you, Miss, you, Miss Carter, you may have gone too far. To save my poor, innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl, there were no lengths to which I would not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. I knew you were false and deceitful, and my first impressions of people are invariably right. 
It seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you have many other calls of a similar character to make in the neighborhood. Ernest! <laughs> my own Ernest. Gwendolyn, my own one. A moment. May I ask if you are engaged to this young lady? Oh, dear, dear Cecily, of course not. What could have put such a pretty idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I knew there must have been some slight misconception. You see, the gentleman's arm who is around your waist is my guardian, Mr. John Worthing. I beg your pardon? This is Uncle Jack. Jack? Ew. Here is Ernest. A moment. May you tell me if you are engaged to be married to this young lady? To what young lady? Good heavens, Gwendolyn! Yes, good heavens, Gwendolyn! I mean, two. No, of course not. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. I was afraid there was some slight error, Miss Cardew, for the man whose hand is present around your waist is my cousin, Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? Oh. Are you called Algernon? I cannot deny it. And is your name really John? Uh, I could deny it if I'd liked. I could deny anything if I'd liked. But uh, my name is John. It has been John for years. It seems to me that a gross deception has been practiced amongst both of us. My poor wounded Cecily. My sweet wronged Gwendolyn. You will call me sister, will you not? There's one question I would like to be allowed to ask my guardian. An admirable idea, Mr. Worthing. There's one question I'm permitted to ask you. It is a matter of grave importance to me and Cecily. Where is your brother Ernest? Since we are both engaged to your brother Ernest, it is a matter of importance to where your brother Ernest is. Uh, Gwendolyn, uh, Cecily, it pains me very much to have to be forced to speak the truth. Never in my life have I been reduced to such a painful position. And I have very little experience in doing anything of the kind. However, I might tell you frankly that I have no brother Ernest. That I have no brother at all, and that I've never had a brother. And that I certainly have no intention of having one in the future. No brother? At all? None. Never a brother of any kind? None. Not of any kind. Cecily. I'm afraid we are both engaged to no one. It is a very painful position for a young girl to suddenly find herself in, is it? Let us venture into the house. They will surely not follow us there. No. Men are so cowardly, aren't they? So this ghastly state of things is what you call bun bearing, I suppose. Yes. A very wonderful Bunbury it has been. There'll be no Bunburying allowed here. Oh, that is absurd. One has a right to Bunbury anywhere one chooses. Every serious Bunburyist knows that. Serious Bunburyist? Good heavens. Well, one must be serious about something if they want to get any amusement out of life. I'm serious about Bunburying. Uh, what on earth you're serious about, I haven't got the smallest idea. Don't about be... everything, I suppose. Oh, you have such a trivial nature. The only small satisfaction I have in the whole of this wretched mistress is that your friend Bunbury is quite exploded. You won't be able to go down to the country as often as you, you, as you used to. And a very good thing, too. Your brother is a little off color, isn't he, dear Jack? You won't be able to go up to town as often as your wicked custom was. And not a bad thing, either. As for your conduct towards Miss Cardew, I think your taking in a sweet, nice, innocent girl like that is quite inexcusable, to say nothing of the fact that she is my ward. Well, I can see no possible defense of your deceiving a brilliant, clever, thoroughly experienced young lady such as Miss Fairfax to say nothing of the fact that she is my cousin. That is no business of yours. I certainly see no chance of you marrying Miss Cardew. 
I wanted to be engaged to Gwendolyn. I'm in love with her. Well, I simply wanted to be engaged to Cecily. I adore her. I certainly see no chance of you marrying Miss Cardew. Well, I can see no likelihood, Jack, of you and Miss Fairfax ever being united. But that is no business of yours. If it were my business, I wouldn't talk about it. It's very vulgar to talk of one's own business in public. Only stockbrokers ever do that, and very rarely at dinner parties. How could you sit there, calmly eating muffins, when we're in the whole of this wretched business? I can't quite make it out. You seem to me to be perfectly heartless. Well, I can't eat muffins in an agitated manner. The butter would probably get on my cuffs. Besides, I'm particularly fond of muffins. I don't see how you can... I think it's perfectly heartless you're eating anything at all under the circumstances. When I am in trouble, food is the only thing that consoles me. Indeed, when I am in very great trouble, as anyone who knows me intimately can tell you, I refuse everything but food and drink. At the present, I am eating muffins because I am unhappy. But that is no reason why I should eat them all in that greedy way. Have some tea cake. I don't like tea cake. Good heavens. Well, I suppose a man may eat his own muffins in his own garden. But you had just said that it was perfectly heartless to eat muffins. I said it was perfectly heartless of you under the circumstances, and that is a very different thing. Yes, but the muffins are the same. Algy, I wish you to goodness you would go. Well, you can't ask me to go without having my dinner. I never leave without my dinner. It's absurd. Only vegetarians and people like that ever do. Besides, I have just made arrangements with Dr. Chasuble to be christened at a quarter to six under the name of Ernest. Oh, I highly doubt that, and I assure you nothing of the kind. I made arrangements this morning with Dr. Chasuble to be christened at 5.30, and I naturally will take the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn would wish it. We, we can't both be christened Ernest. That is absurd. Besides, there is no evidence whatsoever concerning that I've ever been christened before in my life, and I would think it very probable. And so does Dr. Charzable. The case is entirely different for you. You have been christened already. Yes, but I haven't been christened for years. Yes, but you have been christened, and that is the important part. Quite so. So I know my constitution can stand it. If you're not sure of your ever being christened, I must say, I find it rather dangerous you're venturing on it now. You can't hardly have forgotten that someone very closely connected to you was very nearly carried off this week in Paris by a severe chill. Yes, but you said yourself that a severe chill was not hereditary. It usedn't to be, I admit, but I dare say it is now. It's always making wonderful improvements on things. Yeah, gee, that is nonsense. You are always talking nonsense. Jack, you are at the muffins again. I wish you wouldn't. Told you that I am particularly fond of muffins. But I hate tea cake. Then why on earth do you allow it to be served to your guests? What ideas you have of hospitality? Algy, I have told you to go. I don't want you here. Why don't you go? Well, I, quite, I haven't quite finished my tea yet. And besides, there's still one muffin left.
The fact they do not follow me into the house as anyone else would have done seems to me that they have some sense of shame left. They have been eating muffins. That looks like repentance. They don't seem to notice us. Couldn't you cough? But I haven't got a cough. They're looking at us. What effrontery. That's so forward of them. Let us preserve a dignified silence. Yes, certainly. It's the only thing to do now. My dear Cecily, I love you. My heart must be so swayed. Think of us together. Think of all those lovely letters. Think of how we are engaged. Hey, dilly da, nonny, nonny. Hey, dilly da, nonny, new. To lure, to allure, hey, dilly da, nonny, new. Gwendolyn, my darling, I adore you. Just give me one look back. Just a glance, just a peek, nothing's needed and looks so bleak. Just remember, his name's Jack. <laughs> hey, dilly da, nonny, nonny. Hey, dilly da, nonny, new. Tlu, rae, tru, lu, rae. Hey, dilly da, nonny, new. You're the prettiest I've ever met. Have you ever met a man with all that debt? We are engaged, it says so in your diary. But just remember that your engagement was a made up story. <sighs> Try to forget about my name, dear. Though I don't wish to brag, I'm the ideal husband. Just remember how his first house was in old hand. Beg Hey dilly da nonny nonny Hey dilly da nonny new To do right to a lure Hey dilly da nonny new silence seems to produce an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we will not be the first to speak. Certainly not. Mr. Worthing, there is one question that I am permitted to ask you, and much depends on your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. Mr. Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? so that I may have the opportunity of meeting you. That seems a satisfactory explanation, does it not? Yes, dear, if you can believe him. No, I don't! But it does not affect the beauty of his answer. True. In matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. Mr. Worthing, may I ask what your reason was for pretending to have a brother? Was it in... The thought that you might be able to come up to town to see me as often as possible. Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the gravest doubts upon the subject, but I intend to crush them. This is not the time for German skepticism. The explanations seem to be quite satisfactory, do they not? Especially Mr. Worthing's. They have the stamp of truth upon it. I am more than content with what Mr. Moncrief said. His voice alone inspired him with absolute credulity. Then you think we should forgive them? Yes! I mean, no. True. I forgot the most important fact. It is the most distasteful one. Which one of us should tell them? Couldn't we both speak at the same time? A great idea. I nearly always speak at the same time as others. Would you take the time for me? Certainly. Your, Your Christian, Christian names are still an insuperable barrier. barrier. That, that is, is all. Our, Our Christian, Christian names. Is that all? But, but we, are we are going, going to be christened this afternoon. 
You would do this terrible thing for me? I will. To please me, you are ready to face this fearful ordeal. I am. How absurd to talk about equality of the sexes. In moments like these, men are infinitely beyond us. We are. They have moments of courage which we women know absolutely nothing. Darling. Darling, darling. <coughs> Lady Bracknell. Gwendolyn, what does this mean? Merely that I'm engaged to Mr. Worth, Mama. Come here. Sit down. Sit down immediately. Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young, of physical weak in the old. Apprised, sir, by my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin, I followed her at once by a luggage train. Her unhappy father is, I am glad to say, under the impression she is attending a more than usually lengthy lecture by the university extension scheme on the influence of permanent income on thought. I do not propose to undeceive him. In fact, I have never undeceived him for a moment. I would consider it wrong. But of course, Mr. Worthing, you would understand that all communication between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately from this moment. On this point, as indeed on all points, I am firm. But I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. You are nothing of the kind, sir. Now as regards Algernon. Algernon? Yes, Aunt Agasta. May I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? Oh, no. Bunbury doesn't live here. Bunbury is somewhere else at the present. In fact, Bunbury is dead. Dead? When did Mr. Bunbury die? Seth must have been extremely sudden. Oh, I killed Bunbury this afternoon. I, I mean... Bunbury died this afternoon. What did he die of? Oh, Bunbury? He, he was quite exploded. Exploded? Was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I was not aware Mr. Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he's well punished for his morbidity. My dear Aunt Augusta, what I meant to say was that Bunbury was found out. The doctors found that Bunbury could not live anymore, so Bunbury is dead. He seems to have had great confidence in the opinion of his physicians. I'm glad to say, however, that he made up his mind at the last to some definite course of action and acted under proper medical advice. Now that we have finally got rid of this Mr. Bunbury, may I ask, Mr. Worthing, who is that young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is holding in what seems to me a peculiarly unnecessary manner? That lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. I am engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon. Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married. I do not know if there's anything peculiarly exciting in this particular part of Hedfordshire, but the amount of engagements that go on seem to me considerably above the proper average as statistics have laid down for our guidance. I think some preliminary inquiry on my part might not be out of place. My dear Mr. Worthing, is Miss Cardew at all connected to me at any of the larger railway stations in London? I merely desire information. Till yesterday, I had no idea there were any families of persons whose origin was a terminus. Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, SW, Gervais Park, Dorking, Surrey, and the Sporan, Fifeshire, NB. Three addresses. That sounds not unsatisfactory. They always inspire confidence, even in tradesmen. But what proof have I of their authenticity? I, I've kept the court guides of the period, and they are open to your inspection, Lady Bracknell. <laughs> I've known strange errors in that publication. Miss Cardew's family solicitors are Messrs. Markby, Markby, and Markby. Markby, Markby, and Markby. A firm of the very highest position in their profession. Indeed, I am told one of the Miss Markbys is often to see at dinner parties. So far, I'm satisfied. Oh, how extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. You will also be pleased to hear that I have in my possession certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, uh, vaccination, registration, confirmation, uh, the measles, both in the German and the English variety. <laughs> Life crowded with incidents, though I see somewhat too exciting for a young girl. I myself am not in favor of premature experiences. Gwendolyn, the time approaches for our departure. We have not a moment to lose. As a matter of form, Mr. Worthing, may I ask if Miss Cardew has any little fortune? 
Oh, uh, about a uh, hundred and thirty thousand pounds in the funds. Uh, that is all. Uh, goodbye, Lady Bracknell. So pleased to have seen you. A <laughs> moment, Mr. Worthing. Hundred and thirty thousand pounds, and in the funds. Miss Cardew seems to me a most attractive lady now that I look at her. Few girls of the present day have any really redeeming and solid qualities, any of the qualities that last and improve with time. We live, I regret to say, in an age of services. Come here, dear. Pretty child. Your dress is sadly simple, and your hair seems almost as nature might have left it. But we can soon alter all that. A French maid produces a really marvelous result in a very brief space of time. <laughs> I remember recommending to one Lady Lansing, and after three months, her own husband did not know her. And after six months, nobody knew her. Kindly turn around, sweet child. No, the side view is what I want. Yes, quite as I expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points in our age are its want of profile and its want of profession. The chin a little higher, dear. So it largely depends on the way the chin is worn. It is worn very high, just as present. As you Yes, Aunt Augusta? There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Miss Cardew is the dearest, prettiest, sweetest girl I've ever met. I don't give two pence about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get in and do that. My dear child, of course you know that Algernon has nothing but his debts to depend on. But I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind. But I never dreamed for allowing that to stand in my way. Well, I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Cecily, you may kiss me. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also refer to me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. I think the marriage might better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. To speak frankly, I'm not in favor of long engagements. It gives people too much opportunity to find out each other's character before marriage, which is never advisable. I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but I believe this engagement to be quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she may not marry without my consent. And <laughs> Upon what grounds, may I ask? Algernon is an extremely, I may almost say, ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more can one desire? It pains me to have to be forced to speak quite frankly with you, Lady Bracknell, but about your nephew, I do not quite approve of his moral conduct. I suspect him of being untruthful. <laughs> untruthful? My nephew Algernon? Impossible. He's an Oxonian. I feel there can be no possible doubt about the matter. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London, he obtained admission to my house by means of false pretense of being my brother. And under an assumed name, he drank. And I was just informed, informed by my butler that an entire pint-ounce bottle of my puree Jot Brut 89, a wine I was specially reserving for myself, continuing in his disgraceful deception, he succeeded in the course of the afternoon and alienating the affections of my only ward, and he subsequently stayed to tea and devoured every single muffin. What makes his conduct all the more heartless is that from the start he knew that I had no brother, and that I've never had a brother, and that I never had intended to have a brother. I distinctly told him that yesterday myself. <laughs> Ahem, Mr. Worthing, after careful consideration, I have decided entirely to overlook my nephew's conduct to you. Oh, how... How greatly generous of you, Lady Bracknell. However, my decision is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Come here, sweet child. How old are you, dear? Well, uh, I'm really only 18, but I always confess to 20 at evening parties. You're perfectly right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. It looks so calculating. 18, but admitting to 20 at evening parties. Well, it will not be that long before you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I suppose any of your guardian's consent is not a matter of any importance. I beg your pardon again, Lady Bracknell, but I believe it is according to the terms of her grandfather's will that she does not, that she may not have consent until she is of age of 35. That does not seem to me a grave objection. 
Thirty-five is a very attractive age. London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have, of their own free choice, remained thirty-five for years. Lady Dumbleton is an instant at point. To my own knowledge, she has been thirty-five ever since she arrived at the age of forty, which is many years ago now. I see no reason why dear Cecily will not be even still more attractive at the age you mentioned than she is at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. Okay. Algie, could you wait for me till I was thirty-five? Of course I could, Cecily. You know I could. Yes, I knew that instinctively, but I could not wait that long. I am not punctual myself, I know, but I admire punctuality in others. Waiting even five minutes makes me rather cross. Then what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr. Moncrief. My dear Mr. Worthing, as Miss Cardew states positively that she cannot wait till she is the age of 35, a comment which I may seem to say shows a somewhat impatient nature, I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. My dear Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your hands. At the moment you give consent to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will most happily allow my ward to form an alliance with your nephew. <laughs> you must be quite aware that what you ask is out of the question then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. That is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Come on, dear. We have missed five, if not six, trains to miss any more might expose us to comment on the platform. Everything is quite ready for the christenings. The christenings, sir? Is that not somewhat premature? Both these men have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. <laughs> At their age, the idea is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptized. I will not hear of such excesses. Lord Bracknell would be highly displeased if he, was, he found out that was the way in which you wasted your time and money. Am I to understand, then, that there are to be no christenings at all this afternoon? I, I think it would be of much very practical value to either of us. I'm grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing. They savor the views of the Anabaptists, views that I have completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. However, as your present mood seems to be one peculiarly secular, I will not intrude any longer. Indeed, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I am on my way to join her. Pray allow me to detain you for a moment. This may be a matter of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism that you mention a female of repellent aspect, remotely connected with education? She is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. May I ask what position she holds in your household? I'm a celibate, madam. Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, is Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion for the last three years. Despite of what I hear of her, I must see her at once. Let her be sent for. She approaches. She's nigh. I was told you expected me in the vestry, dear Canon. I've been waiting for you there for an hour and three quarters. Prism? Come here, Prism! Twenty-eight years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house, number 104, Upper Grubsner Street, in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. Three weeks later, after the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself on a remote corner of Bayswater. In the, in the perambulator, there was a volume, three-volume novel of more than revolting sentimentality. But the baby was not there. Where is that baby, Prism? Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame that I do not know. I only wish that I did. The plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day that you mention, a day that is forever branded on my memory, I prepared as usual to take the baby out in its perambulator. I also had with me a somewhat old but capacious handbag with which I had intended to place the manuscript of a three-volume novel that I had written during a few unoccupied hours. In a moment of mental abstraction, which I can never forgive myself, I deposited the manuscript in the bassinet and placed the baby in the handbag. But where did you deposit the handbag? Do not ask me, Mr. Worthing. No, Miss Prism, this is of no small importance to me. I insist on knowing where you placed the handbag that contained that infant. I left it in one of the, the cloakroom, one of the larger railway stations in London. 
Oh, well, what, what railway station? Victoria, the Brighton line. I must retire to my room at, at once. Now, Gwendolyn, will you wait for me here? If you're not too long, I'll wait for you my entire life. <laughs> what do you think this means, Lady Bracknell? I need hardly suspect, Dr. Chasuble. I need hardly tell you that in families of high position, strange coincidences are not supposed to occur. It's hardly considered a thing. Uncle Jack seems strangely agitated. Your guardian has a very emotional nature. This noise is extremely unpleasant. It sounds as if you were having an argument. I dislike arguments of any kind. They're always vulgar and often convincing. It is stopped. Wish he would arrive at some conclusion. This suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. Is this the handbag, Miss Prism? Examine it carefully before you speak. The life of more than one's happiness depends on your answer. Well, it seems to be mine. Oh, yes, here is the injury it received uh, through the upsetting of a Gower Street omnibus in younger and happier days. Mm. And here is the stain on the lining from the explosion of the temperance beverage, an incident that occurred at Leamington. And here on the lock are my initials. I forgot that in an extravagant mood I had had them placed there. And the bag is undoubtedly mine. I'm delighted to have it restored to me. It has been a great inconvenience without it after all these years. <laughs> Miss Prism, <laughs> more is restored to you than this handbag. But I, I was the baby you placed into it. You? Yes, mother. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, there must be some error. I'm unmarried. I Unmarried, I cannot deny that. It's a serious blow. But, but who has the right to cast a stone against one who has suffered? Or, or cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and another for women? Mother, I, I forgive you. Mr. Worthing, there is the woman who can tell you who you really are. Lady Bracknell. Bracknell, would you kindly inform me of who I am? I hate to seem inquisitive, but... I'm afraid the news I have to give you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and consequently, Algie's elder brother. Algie's elder brother? But I, I, I knew I had a brother. I always said I had a brother. Cecily, how could you have ever doubted me that I had a brother? Algie, Dr. Chasuble, my unfortunate brother. Miss Prism, my unfortunate brother. And Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother. Algie, you have never once behaved like a brother to me in your whole life. Well, not till today, old boy, I admit. But I'll say that I was much out of practice. Ernest, my own Ernest. But what own are you now that you have a new name? Oh, good heavens. I had quite forgotten about the point. I suppose your decision on my name is irrevocable. I never change, except in my affections. What noble nature you have, Gwendolyn. Then the question had better be cleared up. Uh, Aunt Augusta, at the, a moment. At the time when Miss Prism placed me in a handbag, had I been christened already? Every luxury that a mother could buy, including christening, was lavished on you by your fond and doting parents. But then I was christened. Well, that is settled. Now, what name was I given? Let me, let me know the worst. Being the eldest, you were naturally christened after your father. Well, <laughs> yes, but what was my father's Christian name? I cannot at the present time recall what the general Christian's name was, but I have no doubt he had one. He was eccentric, I admit, but only in his later years, and that was the result of indigestion, marriage, and Indian climate, and in that order. Uh, Algie, can't you recollect what our father's Christian name was? I'm sorry to say, dear boy, but we weren't even on speaking terms. He died before I was a year old. I, I, I suppose his, his name must appear in the army list of the period, yes, Aunt Augusta? The general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life. I have no doubt his name would appear in any military directory. The army list of the period appear here. Yeah, these designed for records should have been my constant study. M. Generals, 
Madam Maxim Madley, what ghastly names they have here. Ma Max B, Migs V, Mobs, Moncrief, Lieutenant, 1840, Captain, Co Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, 1880-69. Christian names! Ernest, uh, Ernest John! Uh, I always told you I had a brother, Gwendolyn, and that my name was Ernest. But my name is naturally Ernest. Now, now I remember the general's name. I knew I had a particular reason for hating the name Ernest. Ernest, from the time we met, I knew you could have no other name. Uh, Gwendolyn, it is a terrible thing for a man to suddenly find out that his whole life he's been speaking nothing but the truth. But can you forgive me? I can, for I feel you are sure to change. My own one. Letitia! No, Frederick, at last! My own one, at last! Gwendolyn, at last! My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, it is the first time in my life that I've realized the vital importance of being earnest. <laughs>